good afternoon everybody i welcome you all to this uh, first cpc of 2023 hosted by department of ophthalmology and ocular pathology today we have the clinical discussant dr anita sethi with us who is going to discuss the clinical aspects she uh, is an mbbs from molana azad medical college md ophthalmology from rpc aims dnb and frcs from edinburgh she is currently the director and hod in the department of ophthalmology fortis memorial research institute gurugram more than 22 years of experience and is proficient both in anterior segment surgery including phaco emulsification surgery lasik and orbital and oculoplasty surgery besides numerous publications she has authored uh, several books on phaco emulsification orbit and retinopathy of prematurity so i welcome dr anita sethi you can proceed on to discuss the case thank you dr seema for the kind introduction and thank you to all the organizers for inviting me here to uh, the cpc uh, i mean so many years we were in uh, aims but never got to attend any of these i don't know if we had them back then but it's a real pleasure to be back in alma mater and uh, thanks so much so um i'll start with the case um i was given uh, just a few details about the um the case and they were extremely secretive until now i don't know the diagnosis <laughs> so let's start with our detective story and see if we can come to the diagnosis so the case that we are discussing today is a 45 year old female who came with a history of um a two month history of left eye proptosis which was progressive with associated with mild pain uh there was no, no complaint of diplopia though some mild blurring and she had no systemic symptoms like fever cough epistaxis sweats no history of tb weight loss anorexia she was uh, is a hypertensive on medicine and recently detected to be diabetic on examination there was an abaxial proptosis with an inferior medial dystopia a mild ptosis and restricted extraocular muscle uh, movements and on palpation there was a smooth firm non tender mass in the superolateral quadrant of the orbit with the lateral orbital rim not being well defined the overlying skin um, was normal there was no lymphadenopathy and all the other systemic examinations were normal so based on just the history and examination um some amount of diagnosis a dd comes into mind um this is a unilateral proptosis and thyroid eye disease still the commonest cause of unilateral or bilateral uh, proptosis in this age group and then there are orbital inflammations which do come up in this age group um non specific uh, like what we call pseudo tumor and some specific like sarcoid since she was a recently detected diabetic we uh, think of infections like um, tuberculosis hydatid cyst fungal infections and post covid we have become very much aware of the orbit uh, orbit and fungal infections and as there was a smooth mass palpable we think of tumors and being in the superolateral quadrant of the orbit we think of the lacrimal gland first and lymphomas which can be anywhere uh, in the orbit and also common uh, lesions are hemangioma especially the cavernous hemangioma so these are some of the dds in our mind when we go on to then do the investigations the routine blood investigations were normal except for the esr being raised the blood sugar levels hb a1c 8.5 and um, fasting blood sugar of 145 and the hemoglobin was 8.9 um, gram uh, percent the ultrasound of the orbit was done and it showed a large is there a pointer here no 
Okay, there's a large mass uh, abutting the globe, which has got cystic areas and was non-vascular. Um, there was a mention of PET scan, but I didn't find a report, and there was no mention of X-ray chest or Mantu. We'll go to the mouse. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, that works. Right. So just to show on ultrasound, there's a large mass with um, uh, low reflect, uh, very variable reflectivity. So the CT orbit, uh, these were the images that we were given. So there's a large mass in the lateral part of the orbit. You can see it well on the coronal. Appears to be separate from the globe, has a variegated appearance. There seems to be some deficient bone uh, laterally. And um, there are no signs of osteomyelitis and no signs of sinus disease. I'm just going to briefly describe the radiology because Dr. Sharma is here who will give a much better uh, description of the uh, radiological um, examination. So as we know, the CT orbit is much better for delineating the bone, bony uh, changes, but the soft tissue uh, is much better seen on the MRI. So the MRI, could then we could see that this is... Um, multi-lobular mass and it is separate from the globe and separate from the muscles. The muscles are well defined, not involved. Um, it is fairly large and extending into the um, uh, 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 temporalis muscle, the temporal uh, fossa. And on contrast, there is enhancing especially of the borders, the margins. So it is well defined and the margins are enhancing more. Again, not any sinus disease seen, which is more uh, would be more seen if there was a, a fungal infection or if you were su suspecting even a bacterial kind of a cellulitis, it sometimes starts from the sinuses. And this my radiologist found, I did not see it, and he said that there is leptomeningeal enhancement with parenchymal involvement in the left cerebellar hemisphere. Um, this again, I think Dr. Sharma can tell us more about this. So now our DD based on adding this imaging, since the muscles are not involved, it isn't uh, very suggestive of either thyroid eye disease or pseudotumor in which the muscles and the tendons are involved. Um, we don't, we can't rule out sarcoid though it is usually bilateral and involving the lacrimal gland. Now, in infections, um, tuberculosis of the orbit can have many kind of presentations, can be just soft tissue involvement, it can be a cold abscess, could be just in the lacrimal gland, um, also involves the periosteum, you can see osteomyelitis changes. So in our case, we do have some soft tissue uh, changes. We do have uh, an enhancing margin, which could be an abscess. Um, it is in the area of the lacrimal gland and around, and there is, seems to be some bony missing. So this is a good possibility. Also, in t orbital TB can spread, and you can get an extra dural abscess. You can get meningeal involvement, which we do have in our case. And sometimes we get eyelid fistulae and uh, preauricular lymphadenopathy, which is not there in our case. So this does remain a fairly um, likely possibility. Um, then hydrated cysts. Hydrated cysts are much larger and much more cystic. So I think um, the uh, CT and the MRI rule, uh, rule out a hydrated cyst. Coming to fungal infections, um, especially muca, since we've seen a lot of it during COVID, mostly it spreads from the sinuses, either through the lamina sinuses or through the orbital fissures. So um, the apex is very often involved and diffuse fat stranding is what we see in many orbital infections, especially even in muca. And the orbital apex, and often there is thrombosis, and they may not even be proptosis, but you just get the patient um, with, uh, you know, complete ophthalmoplegia. You see that there is no movement of the left eye. Uh, there's full ptosis, so we're holding up the lid. 
and there's absolutely no movement. So this was an orbital apex syndrome. And also central retinal artery occlusions are common in, basically it's angioinvasive. So you can get uh, a lot of um, uh, occlusions, so the vision will just go without any proptosis at all. So fungal infection also is not, does not, it's not looking like a typical uh, fungal infection. Then we come to tumors. There is a mass palpable uh, on imaging. We are seeing a lobulated mass with an enhancement. So we do have to think of the tumors. So um, in the tumors, lacrimal gland tumors are the most common. So we'll start with that. And uh, it is usually seen in um, the lacrimal fossa. Uh, it can be solid or heterogeneous. Um, these are actually very, mostly very well, um, especially the pleomorphic adenoma is very well circumscribed, round or oval in shape. And because these are very slow growing tumors, there is a re bony remodeling. So we didn't see that in our case because, and the history is also only of two months. So it's unlikely to be uh, this kind of a tumor. There can be moderate to marked contrast enhancement. Another mass which is not so common but uh, must be ruled out is a chloroma or a granulocytic sarcoma. Uh, this is also a diffuse mass with a homogeneous enhancement. May also have bony uh, um, involvement. But this is very easily picked up on something as simple as a peripheral smear. So in her peripheral smear, though she did have some anemia, there, wasn't any, there weren't any blasts or abnormal cells. So it's unlikely to be um, a granulocytic um, sarcoma. And then we come to the lymphomas, which are very, um, they can have very many different presentations. It is one of the uh, common extranodal sites. The orbit is a common extranodal site for lymphomas. Um, usually 25% of these cases would have a conjunctival involvement, which our patient didn't have. But it could even be a lacrimal gland lymphoma. Sometimes we see them in the lid. Sometimes we see them hugging around the globe. They take, again, slow growing. They take the shape of the globe. And um, very, uh, it's usually a homogeneous mass with mild enhancement. And usually there isn't any pony involvement. So these are the tumors which are there in our DD though other than lymphoma, because it can be just so different, not seeming very likely. So now we rule out many of our um, DDs and we are sort of left with maybe unusual presentation of a sarcoid, uh, tuberculosis, and maybe either some kind of a lymphoma or um, a very rapidly growing lacrimal gland tumor, again, a little unlikely. So we will ask Dr. Sharma to describe the radiological findings and after that it goes into biopsies. The FNAC in this case was already inconclusive and the biopsy report will be unveiled by Dr. Seema later. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sethi, for a wonderful description. Um, I don't know what more to say. You've already said uh, all that uh, I could think of. And uh, But anyway, so um, I will talk about the images that I received. Um, so the f it's not necessarily in the, uh, the way it was done, uh, but ultrasound typically uh, is described first because it tends to be the first investigation that you would tend to do. So a single, I presume, representative image of a lesion which shows that this is the globe and this is the abnormal mass lesion that we are talking about. This is far too dark. So I don't know this darkness is because of the inappropriate gain settings. Uh, if I assume that this is the right gain settings for an ultrasound image, I would, wouldn't mind calling it a cystic lesion. But it also has what looks like echoes inside. It could be maybe a little more solid component to a 
bigger cystic lesion or a at least admixture of solid and cystic lesions then after that uh, there was an mr serial mr images this is of the 10th of february now what we have on the screen is uh, uh, t1 and t2 weighted images on a t1 weighted image uh, the mass looks very lobulated uh, i don't have a scale to uh, talk about the size but uh, given that the globe is say about 2.5 cm in size this would be at the most say about 7 6 to 7 cm in size in maximum dimension and uh, it is hypo rather hypo intense on t1 and bright on t2 so which most tumors tend to be uh, the other characteristic here is that it's it's partly intraorbital and partly extraorbital and it's the epicenter appears as if it's in the lateral wall of the orbit so this is the lateral wall of the orbit this is the fat white thing is a fat and this is the lateral rectus the lateral rectus is cl clearly separate and it's draped over a mass on the medial aspect and this mass as i see is going outside the orbit through what i understand is a widened sphenozygomatic foramen so the pathology which is centered at the lateral wall of the orbit presumably in close proximity to the sphenozygomatic foramen is through which it is extending outside the orbit so it's intra and extra orbital um, pathology which is uh, very homogeneous if on t2 if we see it looks far too homogeneous although there is some heterogeneity okay so the um so we saw that it was dark on t1 and bright on t2 weighted images now um this is a t2 weighted axial image we see that uh, it's not suppressed this is a fat suppressed image in which if it was fat it would have got suppressed so the fat it isn't so that means it is, does not have a fat in it and uh, and there is some septations that we can see at least one single large septations and it's by multi lobed in a more caudal section we can see this is also extending into the ipsilateral infratemporal fossa through uh, the inferior orbital fissure so i understand the inferior orbital fissure and uh, the sphenozygomatic foramen are so widened that almost it looks like one single large foramen through which a mass is extending outside the orbit laterally as well as, well as also in the infratemporal fossa so again a series of uh, contrast enhanced t1 weighted mr images which shows that the mass is primarily located in the lateral compartment of the orbit and this is the deformed uh, lacrimal gland which is rather pushed anteriorly this is the normal lacrimal gland on the other side as you can see and on this side it is pushed anteriorly so i would call this mass a extra lacrimal mass and about the enhancement it is showing solid enhancement with few areas which are relatively non enhancing so i don't know if this is the non enhancing area that we saw on ultrasound look cystic so what i can say is that it's most likely a solid mass with some cystic components you know that may not be so much but this is what it appears now these are two axial images and third axial images starting from top to bottom this is the one which is seen extending uh, uh, on the same side uh, into the infratemporal fossa on a coronal image again one can see all this anatomy the lateral rectus again is seen draped and pushed uh, by the whole mass a ct was done later on 11th of march after the mr for what i don't know all the sequence and protocoling was done outside we only got to see the films so again these are the three axial and followed by three coronal images now on a axial Uh, what is different from from mr uh, one is that we are able to appreciate uh, the peripheral enhancement which is more i don't know whether it's taken little early in the phase of uh, after the administration of contrast whether it's picking because of which it's picking up the peripheral contrast or maybe if we had given it time it the center would have enhanced uh, but anyway on this these images we see a thick rind of soft tissue uh, and uh, the other features are the same this is basically thinning of the lateral wall expansion of the sphenozygomatic foramen there is some remodeling also i can see separate lateral rectus and 
essentially the same anatomy this i guess would be a palpable part of the lacrimal gland now on a coronal images again the mass is seen uh, this is the mass this again is a mass uh, going outside the orbit and it's this is uh, the infra orbital fissure on the right normal side and that's on the abnormal side so which is why i said the um, sphenozygomatic uh, foramen and uh, the inferior orbital fissure are all become like one big large uh, uh, space and also in addition what we see are the punctate foci of punctate hyper density now these could be a uh, calcific or ossific hard to say i don't have a advantage of a pre contrast which you know i could compare so this could be a you know dense focus of enhancement also but on these images alone i would just say that they look more like a punctate foci of uh, calcifications or slash ossification so this is all i have to see on uh, radiology you want to implement add or complement thank you Thank you, Doctor uh, Sanjay. Uh, audience, if there are any questions for Doctor Anita, any opinion, any differential diagnosis. so one is anatomical diagnosis what we understand one is pathological and that anatomically seen pathology is what we guess so anatomically it the epicenter of the lesion is in the uh, lateral wall of the orbit which could be extra conal uh, space of the orbit also uh, extending primary primary intraorbital extra conal space and then extending through the widened foramen into the um, extra orbital space but uh, give you know uh, after having seen all planes and all uh, images i think lateral wall of the orbit is what it appears to be arising from i don't have a bone window as i said you know the imaging was done outside it most likely maybe arising from the bone but uh, hard to say again or even a periosteum or a sorry uh, beg your pardon this what cerebellum what was in the cerebellum Bellum. okay so fine fine so you know we also did think what dr sethi said the uh, look like uh, enhancement along the folia of the cerebellum so at for, at the first look i did think of it being a possible focal kind of meningitis but it didn't fit with any of the history to which i had an access the other possibility which i entertained was that it's just behind the jugular fossa where you have pulsations you know sometimes so this could be the pulsations that may be emanating from the jugular fossa because it's not being reproduced in other sequences nor on ct ct was done later if it had been a, a, a definite finding i think uh, there should have been something either clinically or uh, on a follow up imaging which it didn't find so i presumed it would all be artifactual spurious finding and not a real finding okay. um well pathologically it could be uh, it could be hard to say i guess it's not a run of a mill case which is why it's come to a cpc <laughs> is it in relation to nerve is it in relation to some nerve um inside the orbit you have small nerves which is they are not seen independently we infer the uh, origin of a nerve if they you know tend to course longitudinally along the orbit then we guess it might be but here there's no clue for us to say whether it's neurogenic or no but there are two small nerves very uh, sm small ner unnamed nerves branches which it may be arising from hard to say there was uh, i i think it they are calcifications um i don't have a non contrast ct to to see and it could be a dense focus of a bright enhancement also because what we see is a, a contrast and ct but it uh, there is i think a punctate uh, fo focus of uh, calcification or ossification okay any don't uh, lead to bony destruction so uh, 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 but generally in the orbit when we see it's generally a, you know it's a benign thing it's uh, without any bony destruction so extensive unlikely 
If there are no more questions, then I'll invite Dr. Rachna Meal to give her operative findings. Good evening, everyone. So we are coming to the uh, to the mystery being unraveled. So surgeons get to see what the radiologist uh, kind of predicts, and uh, we still don't get the diagnosis, which ultimately the pathologist uh, brings up. So yes, this uh, I would just summarize the findings which Dr. Anita Sethi, uh, ma'am, has very well uh, uh, already summarized. So left eye, abaxial proptosis, two months history, no systemic findings, no history of tuberculosis, no fever, no systemic uh, manifest manifestations of any sort. And uh, we just had a discussion on the uh, radiology where we have a large lesion which is occupying, centered on the lateral wall of the orbit with the possible bone destruction uh, or or what we thought could be a uh, expansile lesion of the bone is another thing that came to our mind obviously we did not agree so much on this and this uh, and then of course there was a contrast enhancement which was mostly peripheral and uh, the ultrasound showed that majority of the lesion was actually cystic and the MRI also showed that there were areas of solid enhancement within the wall of this lesion. Uh, yes, we also had the same differentials as uh, were discussed, but mainly we uh, uh, sort of came to two differentials mainly, which were cold abscess and probably an aneurysmal bone cyst. Uh, very rare and cold abscess yes we did get a mantuk done we did get the chest x-ray done they were negative so this was uh, almost out then so the other thing that remained was aneurysmal bone cyst and of course any unknown lesion which could be pre presenting with the cystic uh, morphology we went in we decided to do excision biopsy and see what it is uh, so having gone in through an islet crease incision uh, extended onto the lateral orbital margin, we expose this lesion here and this is actually this part of the lesion. I put the CT along with so that we get oriented otherwise uh, it's very difficult to understand what we are actually seeing. So this is where we opened up the lesion and this is the part of the lesion that we are seeing and it's quite clearly visible that there are cystic areas quite clearly many of them and this was the area where the lateral canthal ligament was actually attached and causing an indentation here and uh, this was a 10 cyst it was pretty large and we had to open it up in order to excise the whole thing and once we opened it up so this is actually the lateral orbital rim what remains of the lateral orbital rim so I put arrows here to show which part we are seeing here intraoperatively. So this is the part of the bone that we are seeing here. And it was quite, appeared to be quite eaten up and uh, eroded. And within the cavity, we saw uh, these polypoidal uh, lesions, which were projecting out like fingers. It was a large cyst. And this lesion was, uh, the, the polypoidal lesion was mainly limited to the inferior part. So I would say somewhere here in this part of the cavity, we had uh, this polypoidal mass lesion and which was uh, quite strongly adherent to this bone and also to the soft tissues here. So we uh, had to take quite some time to dissect it off and remove it from here. And that was sent for FNAC. The cyst contained uh, altered blood. So when we cut it, that is what uh, came out, altered blood. And yeah, I think I will end it here.
Uh, so this is what we found and uh, I will hand it over to the pathology team to unravel the diagnosis. Okay, so I have to unravel the mystery behind this orbital tumor. Any more questions? If anybody still has any differential diagnosis, any more? Okay, so this was the uh, requisition form that we received. This was on 31st March 2022. And uh, if NAC was done, probably it went through the uh, cystic area, so it was inconclusive. This is the intraoperative uh, orbital mass. I don't have the picture of our um, mass which we had. So this is the intraop picture where you can see uh, this mass was an irregular mass with uh, numerous polypoidal projections. And cut surface, it was formed with cystic areas. This was a large mass, 5 by 5 centimeters. And now on microscopy, this had a variegated appearance. You can see cellular areas, large areas of necrosis. Again, here we had cystic areas. And these were the highly cellular areas. There was, it was a vascular tumor. Going on to slightly high power on the cellular areas, you can see that uh, these are malignant cells made up of uh, basically spindle shaped cells, some epithelioid cells. There were these um, eosinophilic areas, still high power. You can see that this was a highly malignant uh, tumor, epithelioid cells, spindle cells, numerous mitotic figures. Again, another view, high power view. You can see the vascularity of this tumor. Atypical mitosis was also seen in this particular tumor. Large areas of necrosis were identified. And here, you have this eosinophilic material which was seen in our sections. And this is malignant osteoid. You can see these lacunae with the malignant cells. Chondroid, chondroblastic area was also seen. There were areas of calcification, which Dr. Sanjay Sharma was talking about. Again, some chondroblastic areas, malignant chondrocytes. There were these calcification. Mineralized osteoid was seen. There were some hypocellular areas with few osteoclastic giant cells. So at this point of time, we did keep a differential diagnosis of osteoid forming tumors, osteoid osteoma, osteoblastoma, and osteogenic sarcoma. Now, both of them, these are benign tumors. Osteoid osteoma is a very small, benign, self-limited tumor which regresses on its own. Osteoblastomas are large, benign, locally aggressive. But osteogenic sarcoma, and this is the histology, you have these uh, central nidus with bony trabeculae composed of compact osteoid and surrounded by this sclerotic bone. Whereas in osteoblastoma, you have these osseous trabeculae lined by osteoblasts. Osteogenic sarcoma is a high-grade malignant tumor. Chondroid fibrous areas are seen beside the pathognomonic osteoid deposition, which is formed by the malignant cells. So we went ahead with the IHC. Osteocalcin was strongly positive in these uh, tumor cells. Vimentin was strongly positive. KI67, which is a proliferative marker, was also strongly positive, more than 50%. And SAD B2 was focally and weakly positive in the tumor cells. CD99, EMA, SMA, Desmin were all negative. So now our final diagnosis was 
osteogenic sarcoma in the orbit, probably the sphenoid bone. So osteogenic sarcoma is the most common primary bone tumor. Only 6 to 8 percent occur in the head and neck region. Most are high grade tumors which affect the metastasis, metaphysis sorry, of the long bones in children and adolescents. They have a predilection for femur, tibia and humerus. Primary osteosarcomas of the head and neck are very rare, comprising less than 0.5% of malignancies in this region. Usually, it's the mandible and maxilla which is affected. These bone tumors arising in or near the orbit are very, very rare. 10% of orbital osteosarcomas arise in the craniofacial region, most frequently from the natic bones. They may also arise from the paranasal sinuses and extend to involve the orbit. So, sphenoid bone as is uh, been in uh, in uh, as this has been said that the probably the tumor is arising from the sphenoid bone this is extremely rare accounting for less than 1% of all malignancies only few case reports around 10 case reports are present and with secondary os osteosarcoma it's pages disease radiotherapy trauma fibrous dysplasia associated with it compared to long bone osteosarcomas these craniofacial osteosarcomas occur at a later age of onset. Local recurrence usually occurs and which is the main cause of fatality. They have a very low risk of distant metastasis seen only in 7 to 17 percent of the cases. So, I have just uh, listed some of the cases which have uh, been reported in literature. One of them is from our center by Dr. Rachna Meel et al. This was reported in 2012 in a 10-year-old child. He had osteosarcoma of the greater wing of the sphenoid. So complete excision of the tumor was could not be uh, done. So adjuvant chemo and radiotherapy was given after excision. So the patient was uh, doing well for two years after uh, surgery. And uh, I will just speak about extraskeletal osteosarcoma since uh, we think it could be from this phenoid bone, but extraskeletal osteosarcomas also occur in the orbital region. They are very, very rare. They arise in the soft tissues, no connection with the bone. Immunosuppression, trauma, adjuvant, radiotherapy are the predisposing factors. Most common sites of extraskeletal osteosarcoma are the lower extremities, girdle, thigh muscle, and retroperitoneum. Orbit is a very, very rare site. There are only five cases reported in literature on extraskeletal osteosarcoma. Two of them, like this was a 11-year-old child who had retinoblastoma when he was three years old. He received radiation therapy and then he developed osteosarcoma. Another case, 78-year-old male who had basal cell carcinoma of the medial canthus. And he had received prior radiation therapy following which he developed osteosarcoma. The other three cases had no primary malignancy or prior radiation history before developing osteosarcoma. So orbital extracellular sarcomas, I don't have to say much. It's very, very rare, relatively unusual soft tissue sarcomas with an incidence of 1 to 2 percent of soft tissue sarcomas. And another thing besides the extraskeletal orbit is a very, very rare site of metastatic osteosarcoma as well. So these are the three different types and ours is probably the one which is arising from the sphenoid bone. Thank you. I thank Dr. Anita for an excellent discussion. <laughs> no, no. See, CPCs are for such cases. Very difficult to put, pinpoint the diagnosis, but then you had come too close to a bone uh, tumor as such, besides the tuberculosis and uh, sarcoidosis. So, excellent discussion. Thank you very much. Yes, I can just tell us the happy ending or...
no it's a rare tumor and uh, yes i've seen two of them but uh, precisely the first one i had just written it was not really uh, i was not really involved in the treatment but this one yes i excised this one so uh when we looked up at the literature when ma'am said it is osteosarcoma and uh, we realized that it's very rare and literature does not really help you guide you in the treatment all it says is you can try chemotherapy and radiotherapy and it's the excision that really works with negative and it has to be with negative margins now skull base negative margins extremely difficult and in a setting where the lesion is so cystic that the moment you touch it it's it is anyways going to burst open so there is no way where you can say you've achieved a r0 resection and you will have to give a adjuvant treatment uh, so uh, firstly we were expecting benign pathology we were thinking of aneurysmal bone cysts secondary to lesions like giant cell tumors or a fibrous dysplasia in that localized area something we were not really looking for a malignancy there and uh, even then i did remove the whole thing i did cure it out the bone i didn't want to go it uh, go in again and then it turns out to be osteosarcoma so we did advise adjuvant chemotherapy and radiotherapy unfortunately uh, unfortunately the patient was from bihar he did not follow up with us we did telephonic follow up for this patient the patient did receive three cycles of chemotherapy after which she had a recurrence so uh, yes adriamycin cisplatin and i phosphamide is uh, what she received and uh, after the third cycle she had a recurrence she is undergone a resurgery there in patna and uh, she is currently again on chemotherapy so uh, we have been calling her back she hasn't come back to us but we are hoping that she comes back and may this time maybe we can try uh, getting a larger uh, margins on for a section but having said that uh, craniofacial osteosarcomas um, are difficult to resect but they somehow they have not been reported to have a higher metastatic rate than the peripheral osteosarcomas and the reason may be that they are smaller when they are diagnosed because uh, like in the orbit at least they uh, are picked up early and that's just a thought um all the cases that we saw in the literature did not do very well uh, after the primary resection despite adjuvant chemo and radiotherapy so uh not a happy ending we are hoping that the patient comes back to us and we are able to do more and uh, that's about it <laughs> uh it's in cases of orbit it usually will not metastasize what you will have is a local recurrence and in wall yeah intracranial involvement so we at we did get a pet scan done for her and we did not find any other site of involvement in fact after the surgery there was hardly any uptake even in the area of where we had operated and uh, so it was a primary osteosarcoma and not metastatic and um, yes yes but in uh, in skull base and orbit yes mostly it's a local recurrence that's reported i don't think that is diagnosed early you know the osteosarcoma tends to be radiological diagnosis yeah. there are difficult cases which is seen together with the pathologist uh, but mostly it's a radiological diagnosis based on what you see as a mineralized matrix so here there was hardly mineralization number one comment the number two is that do you think intraoperatively if you had a advantage of a frozen you would have treated operated it differently maybe uh, try and got a r0 sir so like i said in this particular case 80% of the mass was actually cystic and it was quite tense so having been able to resect it end to to without breaching the wall of the tumor is out of question what Uh, we i mean uh, we could have been more aggressive with the margins we could have removed uh, a part of the sphenoid uh, more than just curating out from there and probably i would have liked to remove the part of the zygoma that we left behind uh, and which was quite eaten up by the bone so we would have been more aggressive we would have 
uh, been more aggressive than what we were. Yeah, but that but that still pathology. wouldn't have achieved a R0 resection. Yeah, that's all right. So that's when you would have known the pathology. But interoperatively, at least you would have known, uh, you would have made out that this is likely to be a malignant. So, you know, given it being a malignancy. Interoperatively? Uh, interoperatively, were you okay. able to find out at all? Yes. Uh, uh, sir, actually, actually, my first thought was this is an aneurysmal bone cyst. I had seen two similar cases. One of them had turned out to be an ABC. They were much younger children. When we read up, we found that secondary ABCs can occur in older patients and they will usually be associated with the bone lesions. So basically, aneurysmal bone cyst is, what is an aneurysmal bone cyst? It's basically a vascular, uh, uh, what's your, circulatory defect that happens in the, ma uh, the bone secondary to some other lesion which causes a raised venous pressure and then that causes uh, expansion of the bone and formation of that aneurysmal bone cyst. So amongst the secondary causes osteosarcoma is also one of them but it is very rare so we never thought that we were actually looking probably at osteosarcoma we were thinking of the more common pathologies which we could have managed just by debulking an steroid injection like a giant cell tumor and uh, so yes i think if now having burnt our fingers here we would be uh, you know more uh, uh, vigilant we would probably even in such cases we would go ahead with a frozen section intraoperatively and that should help us Yes. Yes. In retrospect. Yes. In retrospect. Yes. But we did try it in another case, and we. So there is another case with a similar cystic lesion in the bone, and which has a solid area quite posteriorly, and we did try doing a F and a B, but in orbit again, it is uh, yes. But yes. Yes. Now. Yes, yes. Yeah, after having seen the, that papillomatous mass intraoperatively, yes, I would say probably would have got something on the biopsy, uh, the needle biopsy. Thank you.